Hi, everyone, and welcome to the inaugural edition of Risico's Take on Comp. This blog is designed to take on workers' compensation's most complex emerging issues, break them down, and present them in a format that's easy to understand. Today, I have the privilege of talking with one of my good friends from the industry, Mr. Mark Pugh, about potentially one of the most polarizing issues in workers' compensation, medical marijuana. Now, Mark has developed a reputation in the industry for being a weed expert. You tell me, does this guy look like a weed expert to you? Now, we've broken down our conversation into two segments. The first segment, the State of the State's Medical Marijuana, will provide an overview or an update of recent measures that have been adopted around the country by various states. The second installment, the practical implications of the growing acceptance of medical marijuana, will cover the day-to-day -day changes that need to happen in workers' compensation in order to accommodate or to facilitate the growing acceptance of the substance within the industry for use for injured workers. If you like the content that we publish, please consider clicking the subscribe button. And if you really like the content that we publish, click the like button and leave us a comment. Let us know what you liked about it or potentially did not like about it. Let future viewers know what they're in for. For now, please enjoy the State of the State's Medical Marijuana. Hey, Mark. Hey, Carlos. How you doing, bud? I'm doing good. Doing good. Hey, thanks for being our first guest uh, to our podcast or vlog. Uh, before we dive into the meat of our conversation, though, I, I, I do want to ask you something. You sent me a picture uh, by text of an awesome, awesome beard. By the way, you make me very jealous of your affinity and your ability to grow such luxurious uh, an abundance of facial hair. So thanks for that. You've given me a facial hair complex. I, I, <laughs> hey, I do what I can. I, I can't grow facial hair for the life of me. But anyway, you look a lot different now on camera than you did uh, in the picture. What gives, man? Why'd you get rid of it? Well, it was my COVID beard. Um, I call it uh, Benny the Beard, uh, actually, because it was so big. Um, I needed to actually I name it, I think. And so uh, my, my wife was not a fan, though. And so I made a promise to her uh, probably early December. I said, I will shave it off or trim it down um, on January 1st to celebrate the new year, as long as you can allow me to look like Cousin It in all of our Christmas pro, uh, uh, pictures. And so it was a, a deal we struck uh, uh, with each other. And uh, I was true to my word. She was true to her word. So um, on January 2nd, um, I gave her the first ceremonial cut. Uh, and then I went to a barber since I live in Georgia, they're still open uh, and they took care of the rest of it. And of course, I had to make a movie about it. And I published it on my YouTube channel um, called Good Riddance 2020, um, which kind of uh, went through and I, I decided to in inject the hallelujah course as a part of the shaving process, because that was really my wife's response to looking at me <laughs> after the fact. So, yeah, it was quite a bit of different. I did enjoy it. Um, I will probably never grow it again like that, um, but it was one chance of nine months of just not caring <laughs> and not going anywhere to just kind of let it flow. Well, you know what? It sounds to me like you subscribe to the belief that uh, happy life, happy wife, right? So in order for you Absolutely. to have a happy life, your, your wife has to be happy. So good for you. Uh, you look great both ways. And uh, now you just look a lot more professional, which is awesome. <laughs> yeah. Although the other guy, I, I will say COVID Mark uh, looked a lot more like, like our guy for this particular segment, which is about weed, about marijuana. So uh, yeah, I know you were bummed I was not going to have my beard when we talked about it, but I, I figured I would be taken a little bit more seriously if I look like an actual person that you want to share the sidewalk with. Yeah, there you go. Well, that fair enough. Fair enough. Listen, uh, weed is all over the place, my guy. Um, as you know, you know, this past November, uh, numerous states, both blue and red, uh, had marijuana bills on the ballot, and they all passed. I was flabbergasted. I was not. 
um, because I've been engaged in the issue since 2014, been writing and talking about it and speaking about it around the country. Uh, and so I've seen the, the momentum uh, that engaged. What, what did surprise me were, were two things. It did not surprise me that Arizona and New Jersey uh, and, and not necessarily Montana legalized recreational marijuana, but it did surprise me that Mississippi did. Um, and they, of two options that they were given, they chose the more robust version that provides more qualifying conditions and more access to medical marijuana than the other one. So they, they went down the path of that. And the other one that surprised me, um, since I've been watching this in, in, uh, starting in 2014, um, there hasn't been a single state that legalized recreational marijuana that didn't first legalize medical marijuana as kind of the camel's nose under the tent, so to speak. But South Dakota broke that mold and they uh, legalized both medical and recreational marijuana in the same boat on November 3rd of 2020. So those two particular things surprised me. One, because of Mississippi, the geographic, the, the cultural, the, um, you know, the political landscape uh, in the Bible Belt, uh, and them selecting the more robust version in South Dakota, going full, full pell-mell, you know, into both recreational and medical at the same time, because that, that, that was not something that had been done previously. Well, it strikes me as fascinating to me because, and we'll dive into a little bit more about this later in our conversation for the segment about the scientific literature that's available out there, but it amazes me that there has been such a proliferation of uh, legislation over the past you know, number of years. And if you take inventory on what's going on nationally, and thank you, by the way, for sending me these leads for these great infographics, but according to Yahoo Finance, right? And I'll show an infographic right here. Um, you know, it looks like we have just three states that remain that have not had any legislation for uh, marijuana, either recreational or medicinal uh, pass. Um, that to me is also somewhat staggering, right? Just three lonely states remain in this movement to accept, uh, again, recreational or medicinal uh, use of, of marijuana. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, Kansas, Nebraska, and Idaho are the only holdouts right now. Um, I do want to clarify one thing. You mentioned legislation. These were ballot initiatives, and the vast majority of, uh, thing, uh, of ways of legalizing either medical or recreational have been through ballot initiatives, which means they, they have not gone through the legislative process. Uh, they have not gone through their elected officials. The, the public officially spoke um, on the ballot initiative. Um, and so that, that's kind of a unique setup because usually when you legalize stuff, that is done through your elected officials and through the legislature and through a well, uh, uh, pr a good process of deliberation in theory, <laughs> uh, you know, and all the different stakeholders get to talk about it. Um, and you got different sides of the aisle and, you know, the pros and cons and so forth. Uh, you know, ballot initiatives are completely different. That's that's like, um, you know, voting for homecoming queen. Right. So uh, it's a popularity pot, uh, contest. Um, it's, you know, who spends a lot of money on billboards, who spends a lot of money on radio ads and websites um, and speakers and stuff like that. So, you know, it bypassed the legislative process. The, all five of these bypassed the legislative process and went directly to the public. Um, so that, I think, shows to the grassroots efforts of this. You know, normal has been around for two or three decades, um, and it, it's a great self-defining term. Their, their whole goal, normal, was to normalize marijuana, uh, cannabis, uh, you know, from a medical and a recreational standpoint. And they've obviously done a great job at that because these ballot initiatives we're, we're, we're definitely well above 50 percent um, in regards to their, their public support for it. But, you know, it's not surprising it, when you look at polling. You know, there was an August 2020 poll that showed that 58 percent of the respondents agreed that the feds should legalize marijuana, not regarding medical or recreational, just legalize marijuana in general. And 69 percent felt that the feds should just leave the states alone, allow the states to decide this for themselves. And there's, you know, when it comes to medical marijuana, there's been several polls over the last two years, both national and state specific, that range anywhere from 87 to 93 percent in support of medical marijuana. 
So when you look at those polls, Gallup uh, did a poll as well, and, and they were um, you know, well into the 60 percentile of people that are supporting legalization. So when you take all that into consideration, um, you know, it, it was not a surprise to me that they went five for five on these states. I guess the surprise would be that Kansas, Nebraska, and Idaho have not yet. But if you look at the map, they're surrounded by green. What's interesting in your home state of Colorado, and, and you can probably uh, opine on this a little bit more better than I. Well, but and by the way, Mark, it's pronounced Colorado. Not Colorado. Colorado. Okay, gotcha. I need to <laughs> put things down. Yeah, Colorado. It's kind of like the whole Nevada, Nevada thing. Don't ever say yeah. Nevada in front of Nevada locals. They will they will skin you alive. Happened to me once at the Nevada Work Comp Conference. Anyway, well, that's for another for another segment. <laughs> that's for your Nevada audience. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, right. You know, but it, there, there was an argument made in Colorado and some other states that by legalizing marijuana, that it would bring the black market out of the gray area and it would um, the black market would no longer exist. But the black market has actually thrived um, because um, and I've seen this in New Jersey and some other states as well. When states get a little get, bit greedy and add a tremendous amount of taxes on top of it, both the state level, county level, city level, all of a sudden by buying your marijuana or cannabis through legal means is a 15, 20, 25 percent premium as opposed to just going to the dealer that you've used for a while. And so the argument that the black market would go away has not even, has not happened. Well, listen, you said something that was very interesting to me earlier as you were talking about the August 2020 poll uh, showed 58 uh, percent, I think is what you said, that mm -hmm. uh, the Fed should legalize and 69 percent believe that Fed should leave states alone. There definitely seems to be a gap in terms of state level thinking versus federal level thinking. In fact, I'm sure you're aware about this. Uh, in 2016, the National Conference of State Legislators adopted a resolution that requested marijuana be removed from Schedule 1 by the DEA. The DEA took all of one day, 24 hours, to respond to say that they would not remove marijuana from their Schedule 1 classification on the basis that the drug's therapeutic benefits do not have adequate scientific evidence. What are your thoughts on that? And will that gap between state level thinking and federal level thinking, will that gap close eventually? Or is it going to be a point of friction for uh, state government versus the federal government uh, on an ongoing basis? What's your what's your opinion? Well, uh, just to give you a little bit of background, my initial blog post used medical marijuana in air quotes. So I was a skeptic. Uh, when I first started, I, I have not used marijuana, so I am, uh, you know, not, uh, 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 you know, uh, someone who's been down that path and understands the, the benefits or the detractions of it. Um, I've certainly been to rock concerts, so I've had a secondhand high probably from it, but um, haven't done it myself. So, uh, you know, so I was a skeptic. Would in, but you would fall into like the Bill Clinton camp. He tried, but he didn't quite get there. No. Yeah, he didn't inhale. Yeah, uh, sure. Uh, so, uh, you told me there would be no politics associated with this. Yeah, yeah, I but, did. I'm sorry. Okay, I take it back. <laughs> yeah, but but anyway, um, so I was a skeptic, but as I've studied it, as I've learned about it, as I've talked with a variety of experts around the country and people of a variety of different opinions, I've removed the air quotes from it. Uh, in, in regards to that, um, interestingly enough, when the DEA was given the opportunity to reschedule it or was requested to, uh, the primary uh, people that were whispering in the DEA's ears were Nora Volkow with NIDA, the National Institutes of Drug Abuse, and she is not a fan of marijuana at all. Um, and she was a primary uh, primary uh, advisor to them because uh, I figured when the DEA was given that opportunity, they would. Um, because of the state's decisions, but it is still Schedule One. Um, just to let you know and your audience know, um, marijuana was deemed Schedule One on the Controlled Substances Act in 1969 as a political statement. 
not based on any evidence, not based on evidence-based medicine, not based on the efficacy of it or lack thereof. It was a political decision because President Nixon didn't like, this is my paraphrase, President Nixon didn't like what was happening at Cal Berkeley and decided that when he was creating a Controlled Substance Act that he would add marijuana to all those dope smoking pot mm. pot out there. So the decision to make it Schedule One, which says there's no clinical efficacy for it, um, and there's high abuse, high proper possibility for abuse and misuse of it, um, that was a political statement. Um, it was completely legal and culturally acceptable prior to that, especially uh, prior to 1937 when Harry, Harry, Harry Anslinger started uh, the the uh, the bureau um, that talked that uh, was dealing with narcotics, and so. Um, this whole thing has been political in nature from the very beginning. So mm. about three or four years ago, I started talking about when, not if, the DEA or Congress reschedules it. Because at this point, um, I don't know uh, uh, the, the, uh, the the Congress, the U.S. Congress has a bill called the Moore Bill, which would bypass the DEA and legalize or decri decriminalize basically, and then legalize slash reschedule marijuana to be not schedule one anymore. So the decision to take it off, which I think is is a function of time, it's not an if, it's when, uh, mm -hmm. will be a political statement and keeping in line with the state, uh, state governments. So it's interesting, I know we're gonna talk about the science in a little bit, but when you look at schedule one, Schedule one says that there's no medical use for this particular drug, but the FDA has said there already is <laughs> uh, with, with some approvals that they've done recently. So, um, you know, our federal government is a little schizophrenic um, beyond what you probably think in it anyway <laughs> when this is being recorded. Uh, but schizophrenic in that different departments believe different things and have done different things associated with marijuana. But I think to answer your question. Uh, at the long end uh, of an answer, um, it's a matter of when it's legalized and decriminalized at the federal level and bring it in sync with states, that an if. But I don't think it will ever be something that the feds do in whole. I think the states have to have their own unique approach to it. Every state is different. The politics are different. The way they've implemented is different. Some states are very, very tightly regulating medical marijuana and even recreational marijuana. Some states is pretty much the wild, wild west. And so I think even if the feds do legalize it or decri and or decriminalize it, the states are still going to be responsible for their own individual plan for how to manage that, which obviously makes it very difficult when you're like a multi-state employer and you're trying to figure out how to do drug testing. Um, and what to do from a drug testing standpoint and what to do in looking at medical marijuana for treatment of occupational injuries or non-occupational injuries. If you're a multi-state employer, you've got to keep track of all of the different policies and procedures and, uh, you know, programs and everything for each of those individual states. So unfortunately, I think that's the way it's going to stay. Well, and I tend to agree with you, Mark, just, you know, if you're reading you know, what's going on on the legislative landscape. I don't know that there really is a way to to turn this boat around. I think it's long gone. I think that it's just a matter of time before that federal consensus matches up with the state level consensus. So I agree with you there. Based on that trend that we foresee or that prediction, our mutual friend Joe Peduta has his annual predictions, which by the way, 2020 was a tough year for him, but he'll do better 2021. Um, you know, because of everything going going on there, let's talk a little bit about some of the implications that that means for the world of workers' compensation, right? Let's start off with reimbursement. So 2016, the brave, courageous state of New, New Mexico, and I mean that for all my New Mexican friends, uh, they established a fee schedule, right, for medical marijuana's use and workers' compensation thereby requiring insurance carriers to reimburse injured workers of the use of weed uh, for medical purposes. So my question to you is, will other states follow New Mexico's lead? Well, the, the, the New Mexico journey actually started in 2014 with the case of Greg Villapondo, um, when that was the first one that a court required uh, reimbursement because it was deemed reasonable and necessary by a physician. And obviously, as, as you know, work comp statutes require reimbursement for 
reasonable and necessary treatment. There were two other court cases. So by the time 2016 came around, um, pretty much everybody understood that this was not going away. Um, I actually was in Santa Fe. Um, I think we actually had lunch one time in Santa Fe. Uh, you did. It was very good. Absolutely. Outdoor Mexican um, uh, food. I, f I forget exactly what it was, but it was really tasting. Of course, the, you know, the time that we always spend is always uh, fun. Um, oh, thank you. Thank we, I think we can classify our relationship as a real uh, bromance, I would think. I mean, I don't know. Maybe not. Well, I, I, I hadn't thought in terms of making a Hallmark movie out of it, but <laughs> I, I, I suppose that could possibly be. We, we've, we've certainly broken bread uh, and uh, hoisted a glass or two in a variety of different uh, locations and temperatures. Yes, yes. It's been fun, my friend, for sure. I interrupted, though. Please continue. That, that's OK. This is the way it's supposed to work. Right. Um, so I, I think we were both there in support of lobbying uh, uh, for um, uh, laws, legislative practice that would exclude or prohibit reimbursement because there were concerns by payers in New Mexico that they were actually going to be on the hook for it. Um, and that lost. But during that same process, I got to know the administration um, of Work Comp in New Mexico uh, and had some conversations about the fee schedule, which is twelve dollars and two cents per dry gram in case anybody's interested. Um, and I spoke to the economist who came up with that. And he said he did research in New Mexico uh, for dispensaries existing in New Mexico and surrounding states, including your home state of Colorado. Uh, and uh <laughs> I love the way it, it sounds coming out of your mouth, though. I couldn't pull it off. Colorado. Okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, but he did the research um, and he felt like $12.02 per dry gram was a legitimate number that was marketplace uh, competitive, that that would be something that would give the dispensaries room to make the profit that they were um, and also give payers, um, you know, the, 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 the thought that they're paying a reasonable price. But the whole reason for the $12.02 per dry gram added to the fee schedule right next to what you're supposed to pay for an MRI, right next to what you're supposed to pay for physical therapy, right next to what you're supposed to pay, pay for prescription drugs that were approved by the FDA, was some solidity, some, some solidification. When it comes time for payers to reimburse, they have something to, to latch on to. Um, and so I, it's been surprising to me that other states haven't done, it was more, and I talked with the administrator, it was more of a defensive mechanism. He saw the tea leaves. He understood that the court, that at that point, three court cases had reimbursed medical marijuana. He also understood that payers were voluntarily paying for medical marijuana, reimbursing for it, without a court having to tell them. They looked at the finances. They looked at potentially at replacing prescription drugs like Oxycontin and Xanax and Soma. And they decided that it was a, a reasonable, necessary for, from, from their perspective as well. So he said this was a defensive mechanism. If, if we're down this path, let's not hide our hand, head in the sand. Let's go ahead and embrace it and go, OK, let's give them some ideas to what they should pay for it. So I've been kind of surprised as other states have court decisions that have mandated reimbursement or as payers have been voluntarily doing that. And I've had a off the record discussions with payers around the country. And there are a lot of them that are voluntarily reimbursing for medical marijuana, not telling anybody about it. But I've been kind of surprised that other states haven't incorporated this into their fee schedule. And I'm not really sure why, um, but I think it, it's it's probably at some point uh, states have to consider that um, because as it becomes more of an accepted practice and work comp to reimburse for medical marijuana, um, I think guidance on the pricing is going to be important, um, both from a payer and a provider standpoint. Well, speaking from a car carrier perspective, as you know, Risico, and this is a shameless plug for our company, Risico is a, is a multifaceted organization. And one of the operations uh, that we have in house is, is to underwrite uh, workers' compensation for a lot of the agricultural operations in the Central Valley in California. Uh, and so one of the concerns or one of the challenges that carriers face, Mark, is the fact that really from an insurance perspective, there's very little uh, medical about medicinal marijuana, right? So how do you prescribe medicinal marijuana? What is an appropriate amount for any respective uh, injury or illness, right? How do doctors support their prescriptions of it? 
To date, it's my understanding that they don't necessarily prescribe marijuana. They make a, re- a recommendation for the use of, of medical marijuana to injured workers. And even then, uh, you know, it really just depends on how your doctor feels about it. All of that is based on the fact that there's still, I think, you know, a, a pretty wide gap when it comes to the scientific evidence that's out there. Uh, and in most cases, you know, the medical treatments, at least in workers' comp, they should be supported by the medical evidence. Marijuana, for whatever reason, and this is one of those things, and you alluded to this earlier, it really has split the consensus among academics around the world, right? So you have the AMA, you have my friends at ACOM, you have the folks at ODG that do not support the use of marijuana for medical treatment, However, JAMA, the Journal of the American Medical Association in 2015, uh, published a a study, one of the largest at the time in 2015, stating that medical marijuana may alleviate muscle stiffness for chronic pain and multiple sclerosis, although they did classify that there is not yet any good evidence of the ability of medical marijuana to be used to treat other conditions. So, from your perspective, beyond the study that I just mentioned, which was a big one, I know that JAMA did a good job. It was it's it's highly regarded, uh, it's highly used among uh, medical practitioners. But have you seen, from your perspective, an advancement in the medical literature to really support the medicinal use of marijuana, particularly in workers' compensation? Yes. Um, so let, let me go back to the prescription. Uh, you're right that doctors do not prescribe marijuana. They, uh, because that connotes a DEA term of prescribing that requires a Schedule II, Schedule Three, or non-scheduled drug. So they certify, they recommend, they use specific, they use different terms that says a physician says medical marijuana may or may be good for this particular patient. Um, if you do consider marijuana or cannabis, which is the term I prefer to use um, uh, as um, medicine. Um, it is the only medicine that so is. You, you don't you don't like the term weed. Um, I did when I first started from a da- from a dad joke standpoint. Again, <laughs> going, going back to my original blog post, I used medical marijuana in air quotes. So you know where I was coming from. Yeah, um, that's right. But you know, uh, cannabis is. Um, uh, is the only medicine where the patient decides dosage, duration, frequency, formulation. Every other medicine, especially prescription drugs, it comes in five milligram tablets, it comes in 15 milligram capsules, it comes in an ointment, it comes in a, you know, a, a liquid. You know, I work for a pharmacy benefit manager right now called Preferred Medical. So I understand prescription drugs and all that kind of stuff. That marijuana or cannabis um, is the only drug medicine that the that the patient themselves now in some states they are they are required to talk with a pharmacist at the dispensary. So I had the opportunity to visit a dispensary in New York, in Manhattan, uh, and there was it was a very boutique kind of a, a, environment. Um, a pharmacist came out and he described all the different uh, uh, you know different strains, uh, the different methods of delivery. Um, the bioavailability of that, wanted to understand whether you were cannabis naive or not, um, what your underlying conditions were, you know, what kind of prescription drugs. There was a pharmacist involvement in that. In your state, it's about bud tenders, because I did uh, I did visit a dispensary in Denver um, Mm -hmm. and it was not boutique. (laughs) It was uh, there was a (laughs) that I first walked in and there, there was this airlock with bars on the window that I rang a doorbell, the guy raised the window, uh, still behind the bars, and I explained to him I was interested in understanding a little bit more about marijuana. He showed him my driver's license. He shut the door, boom, the door popped open on the air, on the airlock that let me into the inner sanctum. And at that point, I was able to speak to a bud tender um, that talked about roaches. And I don't think he was talking about the crawly kind. Um, So... (laughs) He, he was he was a user. And so I was asking him if someone comes in and says, I've got epileptic seizures, or I've got chronic pain or I've got Parkinson's or I've got anxiety. What kind of strain do you suggest? What is it? Inhalation? Is it smoking? Is it uh, bong? Is it uh, vaping? Is it oil? Is it tincture? 
you know, what is it? And he said, dude, we just got, we'll, we'll trial and error. So I'll give you something that kind of sounds good and you, you try it and let me know how it works. And if it didn't work for you, we'll come back and adjust it. That's not necessarily how Western medicine has uh, been handled <laughs> over the past, you know, several hundred years. So it is a great departure um, from that. But my yes answer to the, to the, the evidence is that evidence is growing and it's two, it's three different things I want to point out. One point is that the FDA approved Epidiolex um, in 2019. And Epidiolex is the first natural extract from the hemp plant. It's legitimately marijuana or cannabis. And it went through, because the FDA approved it, they went through the random control trials. They went through the double placebo trials. They did the gold standard as far as what the FDA says, is it medicine or is it not, for two particular epileptic um, uh, 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 conditions. And through all those studies over a long period of time, the FDA says, yes, it makes sense. So if people say that marijuana or cannabis has not been gone, has not gone through clinical trials that the FDA considers gold standard, they're not right because yeah. they did it with Epidiolex and the FDA approved it. Of course, when you talk about the gold standard, they also approved Oxycontin. Hmm. But that lay there. Yeah. It's the gold standard that has killed thousands of people, um, it, mostly by the mismarketing for Purdue Pharma, but still the FDA approved it uh, and said that there was, you know, little, uh, you know, addictive behaviors associated with that. So that's one thing. The FDA has already proved it through the, the normal process to evaluate clinical trial standpoint of hemp, not the marijuana plant, but hemp, you know, similar, you know, the same, same, uh, same family different approach, but it went through the for the formal trials and they said it makes sense. So we've already got a federal agency that says that this does make sense. Then uh, back in 2017, you mentioned the JAMA article. The, the next year after that, the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine, which is the, the smartest scientists, engineers, <laughs> and doctors uh, in the country. It's not a formal uh, federal agency, but it is, um, uh, you know, um, uh, supported through that, they found there was conclusive or substantial evidence that cannabis is effective for chronic, chronic, chronic pain, which is the kind of pain that uh, we often deal with in workers' compensation. So the smartest, and they looked at thousands of abstracts. They looked at all the available science associated, not in the United, just in the United States, but Israel is doing a lot of studies. China is doing a lot of studies. Uh, Norway, um, Amsterdam is doing a lot of studies. Brazil is doing a lot of studies. Uh, Mexico, uh, Canada, the two countries on either side of the United States have both, uh, well, um, they both have medical marijuana. Uh, Canada legalized recreational marijuana. Mexico is very close to doing that. They're doing a lot of clinical studies. There's a lot of uh, growing evidence associated with that. But three years before in 2017, at that point, with not as much evidence there, the National Academies said it, it, there's substantial or conclusive evidence that's appropriate for chronic pain. And they said there was moderate evidence that it would help for sleep disturbances. Now, there were other conditions that it said there wasn't a level of evidence that they felt comfortable with. But when you're talking about work comp and you talk about chronic pain, that certainly is something that's going to be of interest. So the smartest scientists, doctors and engineers in the United States looked at all the different evidence as of 2017 and said there's evidence there. And then finally. I'm sorry, Mark. I was just going to interject for those individuals that are watching that might be, you know, evidence based medicine geeks like I am. If I'm not mistaken, the National Academies of Science that you're referring to was formerly known as the Institutes of Medicine. They created the standards for high quality, trustworthy evidence based guidelines and how to develop them. So when you talk about the, the, the best and brightest academic minds, I mean, it gets no higher than the National Academies of Sciences, uh, Engineering and Medicine, for sure. Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> absolutely. So there's a lot of credibility that came with that. And when I read that, when it came out in 2017, that's when the air quotes really went away for me formally and said, OK, <laughs> people a lot smarter than me um, have looked at the evidence. And again, there's been a lot more evidence that's accrued because of the ongoing legalization. I mean, there's a lot of stuff happening in Canada amazing amount of information and studies happening in Canada uh, and a lot of uh, U.S. funded research being done in Israel. 
And they're seeing a lot of different results from that. So um, the, for people who say there's no evidence supporting the medical use of marijuana, they either have a bias against marijuana or they're not paying attention because um, if they're paying attention, there absolutely is. But I think the, 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 the final thing I want to point out is the endocannabinoid system, which is uh, something that was just discovered back in the early 1990s, has not really been taught in medical school. We know the opioid receptors, the mu receptors that, that latch on or the oxycontin and the hydrocodone and the heroin latch on to. What isn't widely known is the CB1 and the CB2 receptors that are part of the endocannabinoid system. Um, the researchers have shown that the endocannabinoid system is in all mammals. It's not just in uh, humans. It, it's a part of the natural. We just didn't know it was there, but it's there in every human being. And it's really built for homeostasis. Homeostasis, meaning that all the organs, the whole body is working as one. It's uniform. It's balanced. And the endocannabinoid system is primarily responsible for maintaining it homeostasis. And when you look at the CB1 and the CB2 receptors and where they're at, they're in the gut, they're in the spine, they're in the brain. All of a sudden you start realizing where when medical cannabis is says qualifying condition of IBS, what does irritable bowel syndrome have anything to do with marijuana? Well, when you look at the CB1 and CB2 receptors and see that they're in the gut um, and that they, they naturally accept cannabis, um, either your endogenous uh, cannabinoid system that you're creating can cannabis yourself or external cannabis that you, uh, you know, that you, you bring into your body. Um, now, all of a sudden you start understanding how it can positively affect IBS. When you look at the CB1 and CB2 receptors in your brain, now all of a sudden you can see how cannabis can help, can help in Parkinson's and Alzheimer's and epileptic seizures in neurological type diseases associated with that. And when you think about homeostasis and the CB1, CB2 being all the way throughout in the spine, all of a sudden you can see how that, that natural organic kind of equalization, equilibrium of, of the human body will help manage chronic pain, will help anxiety because the chronic pain isn't there. So again, I, I started with air quotes, right? Um, but now I do believe that cannabis is medicinal. I, I, I don't believe that there, in my mind, there is no doubt associated with that. And I think with the evolving evidence that's coming uh, from a variety of different sources, uh, as well as the validation of the endocannabinoid system that's, that shows how it works and why it works. This isn't philosophical. It's not speculative. It's a part of every human being. And those receptors are placed in specific areas that, that fit the qualifying conditions that you often find. To me, the evidence is clear that it's there. Um, now, what we got to do, if it's going to be medicine, we need to treat it like medicine. So the concept of a patient selecting on a trial and error basis with the addition, with the help from a, a bud tender, isn't probably the way that you want to propagate medicine from a medicinal standpoint. And so I think that's the next step. Um, is to provide substance uh, and process around that um, so all the different stakeholders can make more informed decisions as opposed to taking a hit and it not having a response. And so then you eat the gummy and that didn't have a response. And so then you drop the oil under your tongue and now you've got it. You know, there's got to be a better way than that. And I think that's where the science is heading. There's a really smart chemist and biologist and pharmacists and doctors that are working towards creating that concept of dosing and duration, frequency and formulation, trying to help understand and, and equip people to uh, make better decisions. Well, you know, I think that's really where it's got to go next, Mark. I think that in order for anybody to truly believe that marijuana is in fact a viable medicinal option, right, for certain conditions, you really have to get the medical community involved. You really need to make it so that a practitioner, a medical practitioner can actually prescribe uh, medicinal marijuana as, as a viable form of treatment for these conditions that we're talking about, potentially others as we you know, do more research and publish more literature on other conditions. So I really hope that my friends over at ACOM are watching this it's, it's about time for you guys to get on this, to really research it, dig deep, and come up with some guidelines so that our occupational health specialists can feel comfortable 
uh, prescribing uh, these medications to injured workers who can potentially benefit from them. Now, I know that there's a lot that needs to happen at the federal level with the DEA rescheduling and whatnot. I think that that will happen ultimately, right, over time. Uh, but I do think that maybe now is the right time for uh, the academics that particularly serve the occupational health community to really start digging deep, really start formulating some guidance so that our practitioners can have the, uh, the substance and the foundation to be able to utilize them. And really, to your point, Mark, treat it as medicine. Would you agree with that? Yeah, absolutely. It's been a year or so since I've seen the ACOM or ODG guidelines, uh, but at that point, they stopped and started with marijuana is illegal at the federal level, and they didn't really dig any deeper uh, less than that. Their, their, their lack of recommendation or not recommended um, was based on the fact that it's illegal at the federal level. That kind of bypasses the, the conversation, right? The conversation is not about whether it's legal or not legal, which obviously is a legal question. But it's about, is the evidence there? Because that's what ACOM and ODG and Colorado and New York and California and, you know, all Ohio and Washington, all these states that have created their own custom guidelines or, or use, you know, ODG or ACOM, you know, they all kind of start and stop with it's illegal. So we're not touching it. Well, I think to your point, they need to start diving deep into uh, the, the, the rationale behind it, because um, it's not going to be illegal forever. Um, and at some point, uh, you know, the, 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 the dogs are going to be released. Um, and when the dogs are running around the backyard, um, you want to make sure you got a fence at it. Uh, and right now, um, th they're going to be off your property really quick <laughs> if you don't have some, some formal kind of medicalized guidelines in regards to how to address this. Well, and I sort of feel like the hounds have been released, right? I, I sort of feel like there is a ton of people utilizing it. There is a ton of people getting advice from their bud tenders right down on Alameda and Colfax here in Colorado. There is a ton of people already utilizing it uh, with medicinal intention, um, but not sure if they're uh, really getting the best advice uh, for the application of the substance. And that's what I'm concerned with. In fact, ACOM actually, as I'm thinking about it, they published a joint paper in 2015, if, if my memory serves me correct, with AAOHN, and it talked about the various concerns that they have with the use uh, of the substance. They acknowledge the fact that, you know, it is gaining popularity. More and more uh, use of medicinal marijuana is happening around the country, and they published the paper really to present some of those concerns, right, in the workforce. So for example, how do you know when someone is truly impaired and should they be allowed to come to work as a result, whether they're using recreationally or uh, medicinally, right? They uh, cite other concerns as far as legality. So they acknowledge the fact that it is still federally illegal to use a substance, yet you have individuals at the state level utilizing them for medicinal purposes. So there are several layers that need to be cut through and need to be clarified uh, before we can actually get to the point to where medicinal marijuana is in fact considered medicine. But I think we're making progress and that's a good thing. And I know that the folks at, at ACOM are working hard. In fact, I was chatting with one of my friends there this morning and it is on their radar. It's something that they want to get back to. It's just going to take time. Everybody has been preoccupied with this little thing, Mark. These yep. last few months since uh, March, was it maybe February, March of 2020, called COVID, COVID-19, right? And so everybody's resources and attention were hijacked, unfortunately, uh, due to the pandemic that the majority of the world has been dealing with over the last almost year. Um, but in your opinion, what effect do you think the COVID period has had on the acceptance of marijuana and the use of marijuana, both recreationally and medicinally uh, here in the U.S.? W what has COVID done? Well, you know, I have found it interesting that hospitals and churches were considered non-essential businesses, according to state and city governments, but liquor stores and marijuana dispensaries were considered essential. So you consider the mental health and the physical health, the physical health from not doing your chemo treatments, not going in and getting your hip replacement, and therefore your hip gets worse and your pain increases, um, not getting preventative dermatological care, 
um, not doing all that stuff because the hospitals were closed to allow room for ICU treatment of, of COVID. I understand that, but there are a lot of hospital wings that are empty and hospital staff that have been furloughed because they the state said, we're not, we're not going to do that at all. And then churches. Um, I know you're a spiritual guy. I'm a spiritual guy. Uh, you know how important mental health is and comes from spirituality, regardless of where that spirituality comes from. And if you don't have the ability to ex to to manifest that spirituality in a community um, and saying that churches are not allowed to meet at all, um, you know, that that to me is is important when you talk about isolation and lockdowns associated with that. But setting all that aside, weed and liquor were all both approved and were always essential. They were always open. So with that being said, throughout COVID, when people are self-medicating to cope with the anxiety, with the depression, with the separation, uh, with having weddings uh, via Zoom, uh, with seeing your granddad die uh, on FaceTime, uh, there's a variety of things that have impacted the vast, the, the millions of people that have lost their jobs, the millions of business owners that were also deemed non-essential um, and now have lost their life savings in their business because they can't open. Uh, big box can, but the little box can't. So you got all that. You got food insecurity. You got people in, in um, uh, food lines and going to food banks that would never, ever in a million years prior to February ever have considered needing help in regards to feeding their family. Um, you've got evictions, you know, that haven't happened so far, but probably will at some point that people are, are months behind in their mortgage and behind in their rent. All that stuff has played with people's minds. Um, and I think the, 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 the outcome of COVID, every death from COVID ha is tragic. I've actually had someone close to me that has died from it. So I understand the tragic nature of losing someone to the ravages of COVID. But I think when you consider the deaths of despair and the mental health uh, decline and all the different things that have happened, I think the repercussions of lockdown and isolation are going to be greater than the actual death count from COVID uh, at the end of the day, because all of these things increased calls to suicide, uh, increased use of alcohol consumption, uh, increased drug overdoses, uh, that includes opioids. We had made progress in opioid overdoses and fatalities. We've reversed that trend with COVID. Those are increasing again, as well as uh, overall drug overdoses, calls to suicide hotlines, just so many different things that are happening. So when you're thinking about self-medicating, think liquor store or medical mar or marijuana dispensaries, right? So I think people have gravitated towards self-medication over the last nine months or since since February. Um, and I think they have gravitated towards stuff that they may not have asked for or even be in, in support of before. If the only store that's open is a marijuana dispensary and you were kind of on the fence and you're suffering from significant anxiety and you can't go see your doctor, you can't go see your dentist, you can't, you can only do telephonically with your psychologist or psychiatrist. Um, you may decide to self-medicate and try marijuana for the first time. So I think it'll be interesting if, if Gallup and other people do polls, say, in the springtime of 2021. I bet you those percentages in people who support legalization and decriminalization are going to increase because that's been the store that's been open. Well, it'll be interesting to see how that all develops for sure. One thing is for sure, though, and it's irrefutable, I, I think, that we're really living in a great big green world today, right? And so I really want to thank you, Mark, for lending your expertise and, and really your opinion to giving us this reality check and reminder of the proliferation of the use of medical marijuana, both legislatively uh, and also uh, locally. I think that it's important to acknowledge the fact that it's gaining more cultural acceptance, right? To your point, it'll be interesting to see how um, how, how much COVID has played uh, into the acceptance of the use of marijuana socially. So we're going to continue with part two next time, uh, where we'll explore the practical implications to the workers' compensation system on the whole. And so we'll get a little bit deeper into reimbursement a little bit more deeper into the medical side of things. Uh, and so hopefully our friends that click to watch this 
video, we'll click on the next one. So again, Mark, thanks so much uh, for being a great sport. And thank you so much for lending your expertise. My pleasure, Carlos. Always great to chat with you. See you next time.